Hello aviators, Sky here and today we're going to talk about speed. Most of the modern airliners and the whole aviation industry came to a standard cruise speed to improve flight performance and economics of the commercial planes, and this standard speed is not very high. But this was not always the case. The good thing about the times of birth of the jet aviation was the complete not obviousness of things that are obvious now, and the search, sometimes successful, sometimes not so much. And yes. In those glorious times there was a company that decided to look for a different path, the path of speed. Our today's video is about the offspring of this company. Convair 880 and 990 are the four-engine jet airliners developed by Convair in the late 1950s. While competing with the Boeing 707 and the Douglas DC-8, these aircraft were inferior in range and capacity, but exceeded in speed. Reaching the marks of 620 miles per hour or 1000 km per hour, these planes are still among the fastest commercial aircraft in the world, giving way only to the supersonic arrows. This story began at the peak of World War II, when two famous American aircraft manufacturers, Consolidated Aircraft and the Walti Aircraft, merged to form one of the largest companies in the industry of their time, Consolidated Walti Aircraft or Convair. They were actively working in the military sector, creating equipment for the Air Force, and their main military model was the B-36 Peacemaker Strategic Bomber, which appeared almost immediately after the war and became the main US nuclear fist in the late 1940s and early 1950s. In civilian aviation the company had more modest achievements, although their small piston passenger aircraft were not bad and were in demand. Convoy entered the jet age in 1956 when the Skylark program was launched. 1956 was not exactly the early morning of this age. Most of the other major aircraft manufacturers either already created their first airliners or were on the verge of their creation. At the initial stages it was not really clear which aircraft to create. Both a two-engine regional and a four-engine long-range plane were considered. Both options had pros and cons. At that time, the jet plane would automatically become the flagship model of the manufacturer, and in competition with the Boeing 707 and Douglas DC-8, creating a small aircraft like the Caravel seemed unimpressive. In addition, the infrastructure of many regional airports was not ready for jet planes. On the other hand, Boeing had huge experience in building large jet aircraft, while Douglas with their resources was actually considered a flagship of civilian aviation industry. An attempt of a direct competition with these companies, which moreover had already working on their own project for several years, could end in failure. The doubts were dispelled by Howard Hughes. In 1956, while everyone else was running for Douglas and Boeing, he turned to Conwer with a proposal to become the launch customer of their future aircraft for his TWA airline. He needed a four-engine airliner. It was decided to create such an aircraft, which received the name Model 22. But the question remained. Direct competition with the Boeing 707 and DC-8 was a bad idea. Of course, David vs. Goliath is a good story, but this was not Goliath, but a T-Rex. Two T-Rexes. It was necessary to offer something that these monsters don't have. And so, speed was chosen as the killer feature. Model 22, having a close design, would move away from direct competition, occupying the different market. It would be the fastest in the class. This decision became the core of the entire program and the root of the future aircraft name. At the beginning, it received the name Convair 600, where 600 meant the maximum speed, 600 miles per hour or 970 kilometers per hour and later the name was changed to Convair 880, meaning 880 feet per second, which is about 268 meters per second. At such speeds the airliner would be almost transonic, and it was to become indeed the fastest civilian aircraft in the world. It was an interesting decision, the race for speed of the airliners was at its full, and such performance could make the aircraft popular, in theory. However, there were problems. Firstly, yes. It was the fastest, but not that much faster than the others. Only a few dozen miles per hour and now you have transonic. Secondly, transonic is not supersonic, of course, and does not require radical solutions. But nevertheless it would not submit for nothing. 
One of the conditions for achieving such a high speed was of course an increase of thrust to weight ratio. The new General Electric CJ805 was chosen as the power plant. This engine's thrust was quite high and their application was useful for both GE and Convair. The CJ805 was created on the basis of the military J79, which Convair had already used on its B-58 Hustler bomber, and the jet engines added to the B-36 were also designed by GE. After such a long cooperation, working together wasn't hard. On the other hand, the Convair 880, equipped with the CJ805, was General Electric's chance to enter the civilian jet engine market, which was almost dominated by Pratt & Whitney. The second way to increase the thrust-to-weight ratio was to reduce the weight and size of the aircraft itself. This was done as well. With external similarity, the Convair airliner is significantly lighter than its analogs. The 880s weighted about 193,000 pounds, or 88 tons at most, while the 707 was already 117, and the DC-8 was nearly 124 tons. The airliner fuselage was also narrowed for reduction of both weight and aerodynamic drag. The cost of this was the reduction in capacity. The cabin received a scheme of five seats in a row and could accommodate up to 110 people, against 170, 180 of competitors. Work on the program was conducted at maximum pace in order to catch up with the competitors. The assembly of the aircraft was deployed at the Convair plant in San Diego, California. The company actually didn't create any prototypes, instead going right to the assembly of serious planes. And the first of them made the test flight in January 1959. Certification was carried out just as quickly. The FAA demanded the addition of a number of communications devices, but Convert didn't have time for complex modifications to the design. So they installed them into the fairing, which led to the appearance of a hump on top of the fuselage. Technical difficulties were solved, but the harsh market had no mercy. Ironically, the eccentric Hughes by then had problems with TWA, and he did not become the launch customer. The first aircraft was delivered to Delta Airlines in May 1960, and then to the parks of Cathay Pacific, Japan Airlines, Northwest Airlines, Swiss Air, Vyasa, and finally TWA. Despite its advantages, the 880 was not in great demand, in contrast to the flagships of its competitors, whose portfolios accumulated orders for hundreds of planes. An attempt to improve the economy of the aircraft was the creation of its upgraded version, the Convair 880M, which received improved engines, updated avionics and mechanization. However, this did not bring serious feedback. Orders were critically low, and the company was losing money. One more change was another, even wider modification, Model 990. Even at the stage of basic aircraft development, American Airlines turned to Convair with a request for an aircraft that could carry high-speed transcontinental flights across the entire United States territory, faster than any other aircraft. It was a great chance, however the Model 880, with an unprecedented speed of up to 610 miles per hour or 990 km per hour, had a capacity of 110 passengers and a range of nearly 3000 miles. That was not enough. The company decided to start working on a deep modification of the basic aircraft. The new project was named Model 30. It was supposed to fly the distance of about 3500 miles and accommodate up to 150 passengers. The aircraft received the updated and more powerful General Electric CJ805-23 engines. These engines are actually an interesting story on itself. They received a unique design. Around the basic CJ805 turbojet, a second circuit was mounted, which made the engine into something like a turbofan. We can say, so what, not a real innovation for that time. However, the flight conditions at transonic speed did not allow the engine to have a classic design with a fan in front, like it's normally done. In the Model-23, the air passed through the second circuit freely, and the fan was located in the rear of the engine, next to the nozzle. The design was very exotic, but it worked at high speeds and allowed a decent increase of thrust, from 52 to almost 72 kN. The increased thrust allowed to increase the speed to 620 miles per hour or 1000 km per hour. However, along with the increased dimensions of the airliner, the fuselage grew by 3 meters or nearly 10 feet, the side effects of transonic flight increased significantly. 
at maximum speeds, they led to a sharp drag increase, as well as the appearance of strong turbulence and vibrations. To solve these problems, Convert did a great job adopting the airframe design. In this work, they had to involve NACA, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, the predecessor of NASA. The design and mechanization of the airframe were revised. Plus, the wing received several large anti-shock bodies, or high-speed containers, which reduced turbulence and also served as additional fuel tanks. Coupled with an unusual type of engine, this gave the aircraft an exotic appearance, so the 990s are quite easily distinguished from the 880s or any other aircraft. The first flight of the Convoy 990 was made in January 1961, two years after the Model 880. The first test flights showed that despite the promises of technical solutions, many of them required improvements. Almost all the elements were modified. Problems were solved eventually, but the work on the aircraft dragged for a long time. Convoy 990, although turning out to be the fastest airliner in the world, did not reach the promised performance, which coupled with the delay in work led to a reduction in the American Airlines order. Initially, they wanted to get 25 aircraft capable of flying at speeds up to 630-650 mph. But realizing that this mark would not be reached, the company changed the order to 20 planes. Several other potential customers either reduced or cancelled orders, which was a disaster to the barely born aircraft. The first planes were received by American Airlines in the spring of 1962. Swiss Air became the second operator. They were the ones to give the aircraft its name, Coronado. It is the name of the island near San Diego, where after the first test flight, their first plane had landed. Several other airlines made orders for the aircraft, but they were limited to small shipments and, as a result, Convoy contracted less than 40 planes. The Convoy 880 and 990 airliners were unique machines and symbols of the technological search for promising directions of the jet aircraft development. Their concept was to achieve high speed. This task was completed. The aircraft was the fastest in the world until the appearance of the supersonic airliners. But this achievement did not bring the expected results. Yes, they were interesting to passengers and loved by crews, but their operation was too expensive. The unique elements of the design were difficult to maintain, and the fuel consumption was significantly higher than that on the analogs, even taking into account the fact that the Boeing 707 and Douglas DC-8 were larger and more capacious. Airlines could barely support the operation at least on the verge of profitability, and the passengers did not see the point in overpaying the tickets for the sake of a half-hour reduction in flight time. The program brought great losses, and in the end, General Dynamics, the parent corporation of the Convoy, closed the work and practically ended the company's individual business and civilian aviation. Production of the Model 880 was stopped in 1962, after the departure of the 65's plane. The Model 990 lasted until 1963. Only 37 of them were released. The operation of the aircraft also didn't last long. The main operators kept expensive airliners in their fleets for the sake of a good image of fast and luxury transport. But the oil crisis of the 1970s that raised fuel prices put an end to this advantage. Most of the fleet ended up in the secondary market. The aircraft were used as test platforms, charter carriers, and for other local purposes. Commercial operation ended in 1987, after the decommission of 14 planes from the Spanish Pentax fleet. As special aircraft, the Convoy 990 flew until mid-1990s. They remained the fastest and could still be played with. Eventually, at the beginning of the 21st century, most of the airliners were recycled, and few of them went to museums and private structures. Convoy airliners turned out to be a terrible commercial failure, but over time they received the iconic status of the unique machines, different from anything that was created later. Airliners moved in the other direction, an increase in capacity and fuel economy, the cost of which was a slight decrease in speed. This concludes the story of our speedy couple. Like the video and write in the comments what do you think about these planes. Fast flights and soft landings to you.